Hello students, this is Professor Del Russo and I want to talk a little bit about statutory definitions and statutory interpretation. The kind of stuff that Learning Module 1 was all about and the discussion board that's related to it. And I know that Galloway uh, typically gives uh, some students a lot of trouble because of the outcome in the case. Uh, people tend to disagree with how the court ruled considering Mr. Galloway was pretty well involved in that baby's household. A couple of things to remember here. We're talking about words and words are inherently ambiguous. They are by their very nature imprecise and that is really the meaning of the lessons. The statutes that define how people are to behave are capable of a lot of different interpretations. This is what keeps lawyers employed and when there is a conflict or when there is ambiguity or when there is something that is confusing about a statute, especially in the criminal law, those ambiguities are interpreted for the benefit of the accused. It is construed in a way that resolves all ambiguities against the person who drafted the statute or created the statute. So the legislature writes the laws and the messages if you're going to write statutes that can result in the loss of someone's liberty, someone can go to jail. There are serious and dire consequences to criminal offenses. You better be precise. You better be clear. And if you're not, any ambiguities, any conflicts are going to be construed or interpreted against the drafter and for the benefit of the person against whom the statute applies. Now let's take a look at Galloway. Galloway was indicted under the endangering the welfare of a child statute. Now he was indicted for the third degree offense and the third degree offense was very specific under our law. It requires that you have a legal duty for the care of a child or you have assumed a legal duty for the care of that child. And the court really was rather typical when it analyzed this statute they looked at what the legislature intended or tried to discern what the legislature intended. They looked at its legislative history, they looked at similar statutes in the criminal code and the civil code, they looked at the model penal code, and they tried to figure out what the legislature meant. And ultimately they concluded that for someone to be guilty of the more serious offense, the third degree offense, you have to have a significant relationship with the child. Your caregiving has to be continuous and ongoing and meaningful. It can't be fleeting or once in a while. It can't be the occasional babysitter relationship. Now we may disagree with that and we may think that the court was being very liberal there or very forgiving of the conduct of Galloway but at least in theory the court is simply being objective they don't care one way or the other. There's an easy remedy for something like this. The legislature can make the statute more precise. And the Supreme Court can't do anything about it. Unless it's unconstitutional, of course. There are other statutes in the law that you can look at that define relationships between children and adults who may be in a supervisory position and some of them are more specific uh, or more easy to understand. In chapter 14 of the criminal code that makes it a crime to commit sexual assault upon a child, 2C14-2A2B says that if you penetrate a child between 13 and 16 and this child is someone whom you have supervision over or care for by virtue of your legal professional or occupational status. It's a first degree offense. So there they use the term by virtue of your legal professional or occupational status. Later on in that same statute they talk about people who have sexual relations with a child between 16 and 18 and the actor, the accused, has supervisory or disciplinary power of any nature or any capacity. Well there you can see the legislature used different words and in fact this was amended to include this broader language in 2001 
and I'm going to post the legislative comments about that amendment in this Blackboard module. However, it is important to note that the legislature uses different language and different words to describe essentially a relationship of superior and subordinate. But once they use different words, one has to think that maybe they have different meanings. The sad fact of the matter is maybe they don't, and they don't really evaluate all of the sections of the code or of the laws that pertain to the similar issue that we're talking about. However, one of the rules of statutory construction is, one of the rules of interpreting statutes is, you have to assume that the legislature is wise and that they know what they wrote in the past. In any event, Galloway stands for the proposition that a person who assumes a legal duty for the custody of a child has to have a significant relationship with them. It has to be ongoing, it has to be meaningful, it cannot be fleeting or something that's once in a while. The other thing that was interesting about Galloway was I only gave you the edited version of the case that focused on the care and responsibility issue. Galloway's conviction was reversed for a new trial, not because of the third and fourth degree issue about caregiving or responsibility. It was reversed because in the full decision that you did not see, Galloway made an argument that the trial court had to tell the jury that he had diminished capacity, that he had a mental disorder that prevented him from exercising good judgment, that he had a mental disorder that prevented him from forming the intent to hurt that child, or from being reckless. Now, the court ruled that the, that is the Supreme Court ruled, that the trial court should have permitted that. The trial court should have permitted the jury to evaluate diminished capacity and they should have told them what the definition was so they could conclude one way or the other whether he had a mental disorder that prevented him from exercising good judgment. The court did not rule that he had diminished capacity, just that the trial court should have told the jury. So they sent it back for a new trial on something that is very important from a defense perspective, very important from Mr. Galloway's perspective. I'm not so sure he will prevail or did prevail, this is an old case, because juries don't find mental health defenses very appealing. They almost always reject them. But again, I don't know how or if Mr. Galloway has diminished capacity. If it's really bad, then a jury might agree and excuse his behavior under our law. In any event, that is the reason for the reversal in Galloway's case. Now, the MTS case was another example of statutory interpretation. And what was interesting about that was the Supreme Court went back hundreds of years in interpreting the sexual assault law in New Jersey. Because, as you recall from MTS, it is sexual assault where there is a penetration by force or coercion. And the operative phrase in the MTS case was force or coercion. And the Supreme Court had to interpret what that meant and had to interpret it in a way that it was logical, that it made sense when looked at in the context of the criminal law as a whole and all the other statutes. In a way, they had a similar task to the Galloway court. And the MTS court concluded that force and coercion don't really mean what force and coercion seem like they mean if you picked up Webster's Dictionary. The defense was arguing that when you sexually assault somebody, in order to be guilty under this statute, you need extrinsic force or additional force, that you need violence to accomplish the sexual assault, that you need additional force. And the court rejected that and said, no, you don't need additional force. You only need the force necessary to accomplish a non-consensual act of sexual penetration or sexual contact. And that's what it's all about. It's about consent and permission. The court essentially says if a person doesn't give permission to sexual contact or a bodily intrusion like a sexual penetration, then that act itself, the act of penetrating or the act of 
touching someone's private parts without their permission is forcible by its very nature. So the lesson of MTS is, is that it is sexual assault or sexual contact when you engage in penetration or contact without the freely provided and affirmative permission of the victim. And what's cool about New Jersey is we're a say yes state. And what I mean is under MTS, the victim has to say yes. They have to agree to the sexual contact in order for it to be permissible and legal and not a criminal act. Now that agreement doesn't have to be verbal, uh, nor does it have to be written, but it can be inferred from all of the surrounding circumstances, the relationship between the parties, and their behavior at or about the time that they had sexual contact. So I hope that clears up some of the issues in Galloway, especially, and NTS. I do want to make one more observation before I close, and that is you have to read all of the discussion boards from your fellow students as well as the discussion postings that I might make. Now I'm not going to comment on every discussion board, you know that, but when I do make a comment often I include lessons about the studies and about the assignments and you need to know them because they could very well be on the exam. I make these comments and sometimes include additional materials and that's all part of your learning and you're responsible for that.